All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Revelation 2c, eating things sacrificed unto idols. Is it okay, or is it not? That's what we're going to talk about today, because in Revelation chapter 2, we came across two specific warnings to the churches of Pergamos and Thyatira that they were not to be seduced by false prophets um, trying to get them to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Let's review those real quick. Revelation 2 verse 14, Christ says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And then we go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 from the Old Testament, and we read pretty much the same warning here. And it reads, Deuteronomy 32 verse 16, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that newly came up, whom your fathers feared not. Then we skip on down to verse 37 of that same chapter. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So a very solemn warnings against participating in what appears to be here, eating things, sacrificed unto idols. It seems pretty clear cut, doesn't it? Well, then we have this seemingly contradictory statement given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 27. He says, if any of them that believe not, a non-believer, bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscious sake. You know, so a lot of people look at this and they think, well, that's really contradictory. I shouldn't say a lot of people, some people do. And they say, it's pretty clear cut in Revelation chapter 2 that Christ says, we cannot eat things sacrificed unto idols. But here, it appears that Paul is saying, hey, if... If somebody, a non-believer, asks you to come to a feast, or it actually, the word feast actually isn't there. It means a, a dinner or a meal um, or so forth. He says, hey, if a non-believer asks you to come over for dinner, don't even ask him if it was sacrificed unto an idol. Or, um, just eat it. Just eat it. Is that okay? Is that violating God's law? Is the Apostle Paul seducing people to um, participate in sacrifices to false gods and to eat of them as well. Is that what's going on here? Well, we're going to take a close look at this. You know, um, some people actually accuse the Apostle Paul of being, being Balaam in Revelation chapter 2 because it was written that Balaam was there. It actually wasn't Balaam, but Somebody that was teaching things similar to Balaam was in that church teaching people to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Was that what Paul was doing? Was he, was he telling people and encouraging people to participate in idolatry? Again, we're going to take a look at that. You know, when people come, I'm going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that's not what Paul was saying. Not what he was saying at all. We're going to read from his very words what his view was on this topic. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't take the time to actually research 
what is written. I'm speaking of some of these people that, that, that think Paul was contradictory, uh, contradicting um, Christ's words. Words from the Old Testament, as well as the, the council in Acts chapter 15. But they're not looking, really looking into the matter hard enough. It's almost as though they're just on an agenda to hate Paul, hate the Apostle Paul for whatever reason. I've got my ideas of why that, that's happening. I think it's a lying spirit. But um, it causes them to come to dangerously wrong conclusions because God's word does not contradict itself. Whether it's the Holy Spirit think, uh, speaking through Paul, whether it was one of the writers of the Gospels moved by the Holy Spirit, and even as being eyewitnesses of those events, or whether it was one of the prophets or Moses. It's the same author, and that author is the Holy Spirit. And um, Okay, so we're going to document that, but let me just go to a warning here from Peter. And this is a very important warning in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says, And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. That's what it's all about. God is long-suffering. That's his purpose. That's his plan. Or that, that's, that's his character, if you would. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. That's what Paul focused on. Jesus Christ, the gospel, the, the new covenant. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. In other words, they have trouble with. As they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And I think, you know, that's what you have here because we're going to get into what Paul said about eating things, sacrificed and idols, and we're going to document, even according to the law, that what Paul was saying and teaching was not wrong. It was not contradictory to the rest of the Bible. And... Um, Let's move on to a couple of verses. I'll just read these. These don't really, well, they do have to do with this topic, but verse 17 of 2 Peter. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. You know, grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is the central theme to the new covenant. Does it do away with God's law? No, not at all. But it does add a different um, perspective to God's plan that, that some people um, um, are unaware of. So they, sometimes people... Sometimes people who say they're Christians operate completely from an old covenant perspective. And it's easy to get caught up in that. And you have to uh, correct yourself. But the difference in the New Testament is God did add some things. He added forgiveness of sins through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as well as the message of salvation to not just Israel, but unto the entire um, world to whomsoever would believe. That's why he, Peter even says here, grow in grace and in knowledge. It's so important. What does grace mean? To grow in love. Because, you know, love, that, that's what the new covenant is supposed to be. Well, we'll talk about it in a second. I think I got a slide that documents this. But um, anyways, so we're going to, document that Paul's words, in this study we're going to document that Paul's words do not contradict God's word. They do not encourage believers to participate in idolatry. They don't do that at all. And, um, and if you're already convinced of this fact, 
um, there's don't go away because we're going to talk about a lot of other things in this study. We're even going to lay a groundwork for how God's law is to be applied in the new covenant. How God's law is to be applied today by Christians, but even by Christian governments and so on. So we might lay, lay kind of a groundwork for that, give a basic outline of how these things are so. And um, we'll also kind of discuss in the study or touch on different things like, um, can we participate? Um, can we go to family gatherings where they celebrate um, St. Patrick's Day, Christmas, um, Easter, and other such holidays that have worked in different, different uh, pagan things? Are we allowed to do that? Or are we forbidden? So, uh, you know, a lot of people um, have strong opinions on this, and we're going to kind of touch on that. Um, anyways, let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray for wisdom and understanding as we study this vital topic of, of um, eating things sacrificed unto idols, but not only that, but how do we apply your laws under the new covenant, as well as even just understanding what what uh, the spirit of your law um, was from the very beginning. And we just uh, ask for this help in Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And, uh, and it reads, Now as touching things sacrificed, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now, we have to understand the Corinthians here. The Corinthians lived, uh, the church in Corinth, um, the members there, they lived in a city that was full of sin, full of um, um, idolatrous feasts, um, where they committed fornication. I mean, so th this was, um, this was, if you would, I guess, modern day um, Las Vegas or something like that, probably much worse. Um, but what Paul's saying is, hey, we have knowledge that we have a certain degree of freedom, a certain degree of liberty as a Christian. We can go to help sinners in different places, just like Christ did. Um, so we have to, you know, what Paul's saying is, um, if you have a lot of knowledge that you are, that you have all this freedom, now the Corinthians they weren't, uh, I don't believe, uh, to my knowledge, they're really, they weren't really having a problem with um, Judaizers there. Those trying to hold people under um, the ceremonial laws, such as circumcision and, and other, even other added things that aren't even in the Word of God. But so what we're dealing here, what we're dealing with is people that... Um, Really, they know pretty well their freedom in Christ. They know that they can participate in certain events and certain things as long as they are going there um, for the right purposes. As long as they're not getting involved in these types of things. And they are asking Paul, hey, wh wh what is, this is no doubt a question to Paul. Um, what is it that we can and cannot do? And what Paul's going to tell him here is, hey, knowledge puffeth up. Sometimes we use knowledge in an unloving manner. Sometimes we use knowledge for our own personal gain as far as what we can and cannot get away with. How far can I sin or how far can I stretch this line and get away with it and not be considered a sinner? And see, that, that misses the point. Because in the New Covenant, God's law is supposed to be written on our hearts. Every, which means everything we do, all of our actions are for that goal. Love of God and love of brethren. And love of the people of the world. And if we're trying to rationalize different things so that we can, you know, just sin a little bit, then, then we're way off the mark. Now, this can go either way. You start getting knowledge of paganism and how they are, how it's introduced in, let's say, Christmas and, and Easter and, um, and uh, St. Patrick's Day even. 
and things like that. You start getting all that knowledge and now you start putting people in bondage. You say, you can't go see your family on that day because that's a heathen pagan ceremony. Yes, it may be true, but is it the intention of Christmas? Take, for example, let's take Christmas for an example. Yeah, we know it's not even the day that Christ was born. It was likely around the same time he was conceived. But nevertheless, Christians celebrate Christ's birth on that day. They're not, yeah, they do get caught up in the commercialism and so forth. I'm not, we're not denying that. But should we as Christians deny ourselves the liberty of being able to be with family? Should we say, oh, man, they, um, they might have a Santa Claus up in the corner of their, uh, of their, uh, of their living room? I'm not going to go there. Do you think that's operating out of love or do you think it's operating out of the letter of the law, so to speak? Even though there really isn't a specific law against something like that. But those who want to hold on to the letter of the law will, will say, hey, you can't do any of that stuff. You can't go to a St. Patrick's Day parade with, with your family and things like that because all the pagan symbols... And we're going to kind of discuss some of that in this chapter. Is it or isn't it okay? Well, knowledge puffeth up. Either way, you can use knowledge to become lawless and to use it as an excuse for sin. Or you can use it as an excuse, or not as an excuse, but you can use it to lord uh, yourself over others. To put people in bondage. To start adding all these different restrictions upon them. I'm not talking about God's laws. I'm talking about your interpretation of the law. That stuff's easy to get caught up into. And I probably at times have kind of been like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. This doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like what Christ would do. Um, anyways, let's, let's, um, let me explain some of this. All right, the basic stru structure of God's law is as follows. On the top there, you see the great commandments of love. Below that are the Ten Commandments. And even below that are called the, uh, commonly called the 613 different laws. Now, I think 613 is probably a little bit high. Um, this is, just remind you that this is taken from those who practice Judaism and they want to make a little law out of everything. So when you go and you analyze what their 613 laws are, it's kind of exaggerated, I think. But anyways, we'll just go with that number because that's what people commonly say. So, and you'll find the Ten Commandments, obviously, in Exodus, um, as well as, I think, the book of Deuteronomy. And they're, re they're repeated in other places, even repeated in the New Testament. But you'll, you'll find the body of the 613 laws in the book of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. That's where you'll find most of them. All the different detailed laws of how the Israelites were to um, keep in line with the Ten Commandments. So, what, what's, uh, what we're going to kind of talk about is that the two great commandments sum up what is called the spirit of the law. Not the letter of the law. The letter of the law more is down here at the, the 613 commandments. But the, the, the great commandments of love actually supersede those 613 laws. In other words, you could be, per, you could be practicing um, the uh, 613 laws to the letter, not break them, but at the same time be violating the great commandments, the supreme commandments, the spirit of the law, which is love. And we'll kind of talk about that um, maybe in this study some more, obviously, but maybe we'll do another study. We'll see how that goes. But an example of this can be, there was a rich man in uh, Mark chapter 10 that uh, asked Christ, hey, what, what do I have to do? To get to heaven. And, and you know what Christ told him? He basically told him to follow the Ten Commandments. 
And the rich man's answer was, hey, yeah, that's great because I've been following those since my youth. I'm going to make it then. And then Christ told him, well, okay, if you have, that's well and good. But then he told him to go and sell all of his possessions and to follow him, to be one of Christ's disciples even. And you know what he said? He, well, I don't know. I can't remember if he said anything, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. So what happened there is though he followed even, and it doesn't, Christ didn't say he didn't follow the Ten Commandments. He didn't deny that. But what Christ said, um, or basically what Christ was pointing out is that he was violating the Supreme Commandment. Even though he followed all Ten Commandments. Because he didn't love God enough or his brethren enough to leave everything that he had and to follow Christ. Think about that. Now, is that demanded of everybody in all ages to leave everything you have? Well, in a sense, it kind of is. It, does that mean we're supposed to be poor? No, it isn't. But what, what it means is we put Christ first before riches, before wealth, before before even family, even though we're commanded in, in the Bible to obviously take care of our families. But God is supposed to be number one. That is the chief or the uh, supreme law of, the ten, of, of God's law, over and above the Ten Commandments. Um, even if you would, but the Ten Commandments um, don't, uh, don't go against that anyways. But all right, let's, let's read this from Matthew 22, verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. In other words, this commandment takes precedence over all else. It's kind of like if you were in a... Um, if you're in a Supreme Court case and you had different uh, state laws and things like that. If there was a state law and God's law doesn't do this, it's, but I'm just trying to give a crude example. If there was a state law that actually went against the Supreme, the Supreme law, which is the constitution, then that law would be null and void. Well, God's law, again, God's law doesn't have laws like that, but the application of them, someone's application of them could, can be to the letter, but yet violate um, the great laws of love. And we'll give some examples of that in probably our next study. So, but anyways, verse 39, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself on these two commandments hang all the law, and the prophets. In other words, that's, that's the spirit of the law. Somebody, somebody might ask me, Ben, what, what do you keep talking about the spirit of the law? Does this mean we don't have to follow the laws or that we can just kind of make up our own laws? No, not at all. But you can claim to be following, you can outwardly follow some of the laws and still violate the spirit of the law. And in some rare cases... You can actually violate one of the other statutes, laws, and ordinances and yet be upholding the, the, the two great supreme laws. There are examples of that in the Bible. David and the showbread. He partook of that showbread unlawfully. Christ at times was, was um, violating the Sabbath. Um to heal people, to help people, because he was actually Lord of the Sabbath. And, and there are other examples like that. Um, take, for instance, lying. Thou shalt bear, not bear false witness. But that's really all the instructions were given about it. But what if you have to lie to your enemy? What if, you have, what if somebody breaks into your house and wants to take your kids from you, uh, like a, a murderer, a kidnapper, whatever, and you hid your kids somewhere in the house where nobody could find them. And that, uh, that 
that thug that came into your house asked you, where are your kids? Do you lie to them? Or do you tell them the truth? Well, if you followed the letter of the law, because you didn't know how to discern the, the, uh, the lawmaker's intent, then you'd say, oh, okay, I cannot tell a lie. They're downstairs in the basement under, in, in, in a, underneath a uh, couch or something like that. But would that, would that be following the spirit of the law, which is love? No. You lie to your enemy if you had to, to protect your kids. You bear false witness. Okay, that's just one, one example. And like I said, that's, that's very rare, but there are cases where that happens. There's, there are exceptions to every rule, exceptions to every law. Um, all right. I think I said that on these two hang all the law and the prophets, and we looked at the basic structure of those. 613 laws. Let's break these down even more. There are, uh, among the 613 commandments or laws, there are moral laws, there are civil laws, and there are ceremonial laws. And I didn't even put it up here, but you, I guess you could put the judgments of the law as well. Um, that's how it's divided up. And um, let's read Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's what this new covenant is all about. It's taking God's law and not only putting it into our mind as far as memorizing it, but it's putting it into our hearts. And no matter what book you read in the New Testament, that's the focus that's the focus besides the judgments and revelation and so forth. But you read the Gospels and, and uh, the writings of Paul, the writings of Peter, James, John. And they're trying to teach us how to put God's laws in our heart and not just in our head. Um, and you know, one main, one beautiful thing that has accomplished this in large part is Christ's death upon the cross for us. Him coming here and dying for our sins. You know what that does to us? We look at that and we can't help but fall in love with Him and want to serve Him from our hearts because we realize, hey, look at what He did for us. I want to serve him. I want to obey. Instead of, uh, instead of just looking at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this, now you're looking at them from a different perspective. Now you're looking at it as, I want to love God. I want to love my neighbor. I want to do everything that is pleasing in his sight as best as I can because it's in my heart now. I'm not just looking at a list that says don't do this and don't do that. And don't get me wrong, I'm not taking away from the Ten Commandments. But what I'm saying is as you grow in maturity as a Christian, you view those Ten Commandments not as restrictions. You view them as though you want to do them. You're not looking at the thou shalt not. You're looking at how can I and that's a hard concept for many to, 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 to grasp. I've struggled with it through years as I was, as all the years I've been, many of the years I've been studying. And then as you grow and you mature, you start to realize these things. You start to realize the beauty of the new covenant, the, the new testament. And um, the problem is, is we have many people today, and I'd say almost the majority of our churches today, take this to the opposite extreme and they give themselves license to do whatever they want to do. They don't think we have to live by God's law anymore because we're Christians. The old covenant's done away with. That's not the purpose. It's in the, the new covenant is about God's law being written in our hearts, not 
the letter, but in our hearts. And um, if you don't quite understand where we're going with that, just, just pray about it. Study it, and you'll see it over and over, not even just in the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. It was God's plan from the beginning. Um, so let's relook at this again. The basic structure of God's law, you know, most people down at the bottom there, you have moral laws, civil laws, and ceremonial laws. Most people understand that the ceremonial laws, for the most part, have been fulfilled by Christ. His death upon the cross. We don't, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have to go to a temple and uh, bring our offerings. We do that locally now. Like Christ said, those, they will no longer come to this temple to worship me. They'll do so in spirit and in truth. And we find out even from Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that we're reading right now about the churches. They um, were different. Each city had their own churches. In other words, they had to answer to only the local authorities. There was no centralized temple. There was no Catholic church. Because you, you can start going back into wanting to unite all churches into one other than in Christ. And you start bringing people under the bondage of, of, uh, old covenant, of the old covenant. Of the old covenant uh, rituals. Ceremonial laws is what I'm trying to say. Not moral laws. And not civil laws. We'll talk about civil laws a little bit as well. Um, I don't know if we'll do it in this study too much, but it, as we do a bunch of studies, we'll, we'll touch on that because civil laws were given to the Israelites while they were in the land of Israel. It was, they were specifically designed for, for that time, for that age. And some of those things, when you look at them, you're like, well, how do you apply those now to the letter? You see, it's, it, that's something that people need to think about. Without violating what Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, he did not come to change one jot or tittle of the law, but he came to fulfill certain things. Well, civil laws seem to be uh, some, some areas that, um, that can present a little bit of difficulty, but... Uh, Anyways, so someone could actually follow all the ceremonial laws. Like, let's say, um, let's say you were a uh, perfect Pharisee. Even if you didn't hold on to all the extra customs and, and things like that. Let's just say you followed ceremonial law perfectly. You were circumcised. You did this and that. Is it possible that you could still violate the, the, the two great commandments? Absolutely. You can do everything else perfect, even down here, and still violate the two great commandments of love. And um, All right, one more slide. Many of you have probably seen this. We brought this up in a, in a prior study. But there are three types of Christians, basically. On the left, you have those led by their own vain imaginations. They often say things like, the Ten Commandments no longer apply. I just follow the Spirit now. We're under the New Covenant. So God's law is done away with. That, that, that's, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Then you have those on the right. They claim to uphold the letter of the law. You know, big-time Pharisees, big-time religionists. They cling to ceremonialism and religious traditions for an outward appearance of righteousness. They have a difficult time understanding the true intent of the law. And if you want to understand how this all works, just read the book of Matthew. And you'll see Christ addressing those on the right. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with politics. Those on the right religiously. And those were the people he had more problems with at that time. There was, really wasn't an era of lawlessness in Jerusalem during the time of Christ. They were living in an era of super religiosity. Man, we got to be super religious. We are holding on to the letter of the law. We are followers of the law. But they forgot one thing, and that's love. So therefore, the true straight and narrow path that Christ speaks about, where he doesn't want us to go off onto either side, is to follow the spirit of the law. That will lead you down the right path. The spirit of the law. 
That, that's, that's studying God's law, understanding its intent, as well as allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you, to give you discernment, to give you discernment. Those who do this, they strive to obey God's moral law, but realize they fall short and need Christ to make them righteous. And not only that, but they actually will learn from all the different ceremonial laws, all the different sacrifices, and understand the types and what their purpose was back then. We don't, we don't ever ignore even the book of Leviticus. We read it so we can understand what Christ did for us. And so we can even understand what... what some of the things are that the angels are doing in the book of Revelation up in heaven. So we don't ever neglect anything. As Paul said, all scripture is given for our admonition, our learning. We don't cut books of the Bible out because, because it's part of the Old Testament. Um, anyways, these are those on the straight and narrow with a new heart. All right, now we'll finally get back to Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. And a lot of people get like that. Oh, paganism there, paganism here, paganism. Ah! What can you do? You can't even, you couldn't go anywhere today. You couldn't hardly talk to anybody if, if, if we allowed um, ourselves to be put in bondage by the legalists. Think about that. Stay away from legalism. It's just as dangerous as lawlessness. And even more so in certain points. Don't let it creep up on you. They will. They will creep up on you. The legalists will get in there. Now make some good arguments. Focus on what Christ taught. Read both the Old and the New Testaments and apply them in their right manner. And if there was anybody that knew how to do that the best, I don't want, you're not trying to pick favorites here, but when you're reading, who opened my eyes to this at least a lot? That was the Apostle Paul. He was focused, laser focused on keeping the spirit of the law because, you know, he had been a Pharisee. He'd already been like that. He'd already followed the checklist. Oh, if I do this, 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 this. If I do everything just right, God will love me. That's not it. You're missing the whole point. God wants those with faith. Those who love him. Who want to obey him. Not those who think they can just go through the checklist. Oh, I followed it all. Here I am. Good to go. Don't get caught up in that. I tell you what, after you get studying for many years, you come into the truth because you realize that you're free under Christ. And you were appalled at all the different churches that tried to lay extra things of bondage on you. You didn't want any part of it. But then after you study for a while, it's easy to start picking up some of those things and then, then to turn into those people you didn't want to be like. Those people who scared you away from Christ. Because you looked at them, you're like, oh man, I can't even do anything. Those people. It's, it's a dangerous thing to fall into. And this is, in part, Paul's going to talk about this. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know. In other words, he's not, he may have all this knowledge. He may know that paganism has worked in here and there and everywhere. But he does not, he doesn't really get it doesn't get the point. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. God knows if somebody loves him. Verse 4, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. We know that. Now remember the Corinthians are on kind of the other side. They're not, they're not uh, saying that Nobody could eat things sacrificed unto idols. They're saying they could under certain conditions. But Paul's going to kind of correct them. But this goes both ways. Many people read this and they're only looking at it as though Paul's saying, hey, freely eat, freely do whatever. No, he's, he's actually giving the Corinthians here a word of caution. And you'll see here. Remember, Christ said in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 15 through 23, that it's not that which goes into the mouth that spiritually defiles a person. 
but it's what comes out of his mouth. It's what goes into his heart. His heart. Verse 5, for, for though there be that are called gods, all the different Greek gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. We only believe in one God. We don't believe in these other gods. Howbeit, how be verse 7, howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, if somebody, somebody who um, is a little bit weak in conscience, if they ate something sacrificed unto an idol, they would believe that the, the food actually had some kind of power over them. But Paul said, hey, we have the knowledge to know that that's not the case. And Christ backed that up as well. But meat, verse 8, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. It doesn't matter. The food, I'm not, we're talking about clean foods here now. We're not going to get into the unclean stuff. But you're not better or worse. If it's a nice big steak and somebody had sacrificed it in some temple and you bought it in a grocery store, is the food, because they blessed it under a false god, is the food going to hurt you? Not at all. But take heed lest by any means this liberty, liberty of yours, Christian liberty, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. In other words, hey, if this is going to offend somebody, somebody that's just growing in knowledge, would you still do it? He'll, he'll talk about it here. Verse 10, for if any man see, for if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat, in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? In other words, you don't want, um, if there is a, let's say you're going somewhere, um, and maybe your purpose is to plant seeds of truth, or even just to be an example to your family. And they've offered something sacrificed unto idols, which doesn't happen really all that much. Well, although there are um, people who eat halal foods, the Islamic um, Muslim blessed foods, as well as uh, kosher. You see the little stamp on there. They're uh, blessed according to uh, their gods. But anyways, if somebody has a weak conscience and they see you do something, this can be both ways. They can say, they can look at you and think, oh my gosh, why would that guy, I'll take myself for example, why would that pastor be participating uh, in, in eating th something that was sacrificed unto an idol? Or they would look at it from the other perspective and say, well, since he's doing it, I can do this and that. Hey, we're free to do whatever we want. But that's not what Paul's saying. And though, th and though thy knowledge shall be weak, uh, though, and I'm sorry, verse 11, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Think about that. You don't want to, the object is, what Paul's teaching us here is love. That is the supreme law. You do things out of love, even though you're free to go there and, and go somewhere and eat some, uh, food that's sacrificed unto idols. You're not free you're, you're not to use that liberty, in other words, to cause somebody else's faith to fail. Now, we're not talking about if a legalist tells you you can't do something, who cares about them? We're talking about somebody who's, who's trying to do what's right. And if, you do, and if you say, I have liberty to do it, and I'm going to offend them anyways, that's wrong. You've violated the supreme law, again, which is love. And you could take this from the other side. If, um, if uh, you go there and um, you, uh, you refuse to eat, of, if somebody invites you to go and 
uh, have a feast with them and you refuse to go because you don't want to uh, participate in anything that any sinners are around. I'm just talking about a dinner or somebody. And you refuse to go and they might have wanted to learn the gospel from you. They might have wanted to ask some questions. And you refused to go because you, because you thought, oh, they're going to eat something that was blessed by their idol. You'd be violating. Think about this for a minute. You would be violating the two great commandments, the supreme commandments. Because you wanted to follow the letter of the law so much that you refused to go there and share the truth with the lost. That's why Christ said, hey, I didn't come to, 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 um, to, heal those, or to, to heal those that didn't need a physician. I came to heal the sick, the lame and the blind. What did the Pharisees do? They said, oh, that man, Christ, he hangs out with publicans and sinners. He may have even gone to these feasts where they sacrificed something unto an idol. I'm not saying he participated in a feast like a ritual. I'm saying he might have actually had a meal that was offered to him by somebody who was a pagan worshiper. Can we document that? No, but we, we can look at how he operated and we, we couldn't say that that would bother him. The thing is, is what the key is, now when we read in uh, Revelation chapter 2, where it says that there were people there, there was a Jezebel and there was a Balaam. They were there seducing people to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. It wasn't that they taught people to merely eat the food. They were teaching people to go into idolatry. They were teaching people to get involved in the, the lasciviousness, into the sexual orgies that were done. It wasn't, this, this stuff happened. This was all around. You go to a temple and hey, you had a little sex party with a meal. That was not what he's talking about. Paul was not teaching people or seducing people away from Christ to, to, to participate in a pagan And we're going to document that here. We already did, but we're going to go into it more where Paul will give the warning. You cannot partake of the devil's table. And the Lord's at the same time. Do your research. Do not just read somebody else's commentary. Don't take my word for it. Look at these things for yourself. Don't just read something on the surface and say, oh, that's what it says. You have to study. You have to take things in context. If you want to understand, and you should grow in grace and in knowledge, Verse 12, but when you sin so against your brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Again, you violate the supreme commandment. Wherefore, if meat make thy brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now look at this. And you actually have people today that will, uh, uh, that will accuse Paul of being a false apostle. Look at the love here. He says, hey, I will stop eating meat completely if I had to, to not offend my brethren. I want, why? Because he wanted to share the gospel. He wanted them to be saved, them to have the truth. That meant more to him than the strict letter of the law. Do I even correct myself at times when I do this? Yes. We grow. We're growing daily. In the past, you might even pick up an old study of ours from Deuteronomy. And there might be portions of it that I might have been a little bit extra strong on the letter of the law. And I'm not going to go back and change those things. And I'm not a reed shaken in the wind. We're growing. We're growing. Um, are we going to take the opposite spectrum and be lawless? Go on the left? No. But we're going to follow Christ's example and do it Christ's way. The narrow path. It's easy to go off to the right and be this big strict religious guy. And it's easy to go off to the left and say, hey, I can do whatever I want. I'm free. I got liberty in Christ. Verse 
Oh, I had 9 verse 1 there. Anyways, chapter 9 actually carries forth this, this context of the same thought. Wish I had more time to teach it, but we don't. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Amazing how he brings these beautiful types up, the Apostle Paul. He brings a... He, he, he brings out the, uh, uh, the type of the Israelites passing through the Red Sea as, as a type of baptism. Amazing. And all did eat the same spiritual meat. Spiritual meat. And all did eat the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Why is he saying this? Why is the Apostle Paul bringing this up? But what, because what he's talking, he's bringing up the examples of where the Israelites fell into idolatry and they, they participated in the rituals and they ate from the devil's table. They ate things sacrificed unto idols. And what he's saying, hey, Although you guys in Corinthians, you know you have liberty to go and help sinners, to kind of walk the line, so to speak, you better be careful while you're doing it and better not use it as an excuse to sin. Oh, but I can go anywhere. I can go, well, I'm going to go help somebody at a strip club. Yeah, I'm going to just go there and, uh, you know, I'm not going there to see, uh, you know, uh, naked skin or anything like that. I, hey, I just, I'm going to. Go spread the gospel. That's not really quite believable. That's not really quite believable. So the analogy is here, hey, use your Christian liberty. Participate in things. Hey, if you want to go to a St. Patrick's Day festival, if you want to go see your family in Christmas, if you want to even, this is one I don't, I, we don't do anymore, but hey, if, if, if all, the only day you can see your family is on Easter or any of these other days, if you go there with the right intentions and it's not going to pollute you and you want to show love to your family, you want to be an example and maybe hopefully have an opportunity to plant a seed, then that's great. But the thing you need to be aware of is don't get caught up in actually uh, getting into it, participating in, into it. Let's say Santa Claus, for, ex for example, with Christmas. If you go to, if all of a sudden you're going to be with your family on Christmas because you, you in your heart, you're celebrating Christ, but now they're, they're putting all this emphasis on uh, Santa Claus. And if you start getting into the Santa Claus spirit and, and, and things like that, then yes, you would be falling in, into idolatry. That's what Paul's saying. When you walk the line, be careful. Use discretion, use discernment. You are free in Christ to operate in this world. Again, don't let a legalist put chains on you. Verse 7, Neither be you idolatry. When I use the word legalist, I'm not talking about those who say we ought to follow the law. I'm talking about those who say you got to follow the very letter of the law or else. I've even heard people say, well, anyways, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7, Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them. As it is written, the people uh, sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. That's what the Israelites did. They fell into idolatry right after they left Egypt. He's saying, hey, again, if you're going to go there, you're going to do things. Don't fall into the idolatrous parts of it. Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication. Remember that? They're tied together. Eat the things sacrificed unto idols and fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Now again, if you, if you choose to participate in some of those things, be, sure, be careful you don't tempt Christ. Be sure you're not flirting with uh, Ashtar on Easter. Just be sure, be careful. And it's in your heart is what matters. Does that mean you can just do it again? What Paul's saying is, 
You can't just claim, oh, Christ is in my heart. Everything I do is, it's not affecting me. I can go to, I can go, uh, go to strip clubs and things like that and, and uh, do it. No, it's not what he's saying. And only a mature Christian would be able to figure out what he's saying. Those who are immature would say, oh, I can't, I can't. Paul's a false apostle. He's not following the letter. Then they'd say, damn him. And they're missing out on some of the greatest teachings of the gospel. From somebody who had already been there, done that, made the mistake of being a Pharisee and is trying to help others not do the same thing. Now they murmur, some of them, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now these things happen unto them for examples or examples, and they are written for our admonition, for our warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. In other words, Paul's not actually encouraging people to eat things sacrificed unto idols. He's, but he's rather using the opposite. He's saying, hey, I know you guys have, you know you have freedom to walk the line, so to speak. But you better be careful if you abuse that freedom, lest you fall. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak unto wise men, judge you what I say. And again, when you read a lot of Paul's stuff, it's directed to wise men. And that's what Peter knew. He said, those who are unlearned and unstable in the word, they, they don't understand what Paul's talking about half the time. Because they don't understand the new covenant, they don't understand the old covenant, and they don't understand how to apply it, and they don't understand the spirit of the law. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now he's moving us into Holy Communion, you'll see why. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they that eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say unto you that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you have fellowship with devils. In other words, what Paul is saying, if you, if you were to eat meat that was sacrificed in a temple, the priest sold it to uh, a meat market, and you bought it there, and you ate it, it's no big deal. There's no big deal. But if you actually participate in the ceremonial ritual, you are partaking of the devil's table. In other words, if your heart and your mind are into it and you're getting into this, 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 you know, and they're actually laying the, the, the animal down, they're sacrificing, they're making prayers to their gods, and you're sitting there bowing your head, you have violated God's law. You've broken it. And that is bad. You've actually communed yourself with devils, with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. That's what it's all about. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. I think I read that. Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? In other words, again, this is going back to the Corinthians. They knew they had freedom, but they were abusing it. He's saying, don't abuse your freedom to provoke God to jealousy. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. In other words, he's not saying he can do whatever he wants. He's saying, there are a lot of things that I can do lawfully, according to the law. But even if I did them, even if it's okay for me to do certain things, according to the law, it's not okay to do them when I'm offending somebody. If I'm, if I'm putting a stumbling block in front of somebody. 
Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now, what Paul's saying, he's not saying go steal somebody's wealth. I think, I've heard people say this before. Paul's a false teacher because he's telling you to, to steal from somebody. What Paul's saying is don't seek your own gain. Seek the gain of your brother that they can come to the Lord. What, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, in the meat market, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 24 verse 1. If any man of them that believe not bid you to go into a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. In other words, if somebody asks you over for dinner, don't say, hey, did you sacrifice this unto an idol? Just go eat it. Fellowship with them. Spread the word of God to them. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for the conscious sake, uh, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, if he declares to you, hey, I sacrificed this food unto an idol, let's partake together. Then you say, okay, well, it's fine. I'm not going to do that. Sorry, buddy. Because if you were to do so at that point, you'd be kind of acknowledging it. See what I'm saying? So did Paul seduce people to eat things sacrificed unto idols? Not a chance, my friend. That is a lie. A lie. Spread forth by lying spirits. And people believe it. Don't believe lies. Do your own research. Conscience. I say not my own but the other. And why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? For if I be grace, uh, for if I by grace be a part. Okay. We're going to skip through. Read the rest on your own. It's very good verses there. I'm going to go to this slide here and sum this up. The two great commandments of love supersede all of the rest of God's law. Both the moral laws, all well, the moral laws, civil laws, ceremonial laws. I'm talking about the letter of the laws. And we know that ceremonial laws. Okay. Well, we went over all that. Three types of Christians. We want to be on the straight and narrow. So, hey, I hope you enjoyed that study. We may go into another study on this where we're going to kind of look at some examples of where it's actually possible to violate the letter of the law and still uphold the spirit of the law. It's important to know that. It's important to know that. Because that way we focus on what God wanted us focused on. Anyways, hey, do like what Christ said in Matthew chapter 4 when tempted of the devil. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. See that you consume it, digest it, meditate upon it every single day so that you can be a Christian overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to help support Christian Overcomers, you can do so by becoming a member for a $15 a month tithe, donation, or offering, simply by going to christianovercomers.com. All memberships include unlimited access to all current and archived audio podcasts that can be saved and downloaded for listening at your convenience. God bless you. And thank you for your support.